This is Luke Pinkerton. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Helix and I'm going to be going over some of the basics of Helix Steel technology as well as its design approach. Uh, my background is in structural engineering and I've been involved with Helix for years. Helix was originally developed as a blast and earthquake resistant concrete uh, reinforcement. The test results that you see here are uh, primary evidence of this, but it also illustrates really what Helix does to concrete. And that is fundamentally, it works like a composite material. Rebar um, acts as a, a backup reinforcement to concrete. Once the concrete is broken, it starts to carry the load. So as you can see on the left there, when we detonate a charge that simulates a personal improvised explosive device uh, near uh, this panel, which was actually designed based on the International Blast Resistant Concrete Design Code, it just shatters the concrete. The rebar remains there, but it shatters the concrete around it. And that's because the rebar doesn't really do anything to the concrete until the concrete's actually failed. And obviously this is an extreme case, a blast resistant case, but the same thing happens with ordinary re rebar reinforced concrete under just normal loads. The concrete has to first crack before the rebar can carry any load. The sample on the other side, on the right hand side here, has helix in it. And there's a significant difference in what you see there. You don't see all the spalling and damage. You see some small cracks, but what you see is that helix has effectively redistributed the load throughout that, that concrete panel instead of allowing the, the explosive device to just completely destroy the panel like it did with the re rebar reinforced panel. So although blast resistance is a very uh, interesting application for us, it represents only a very small uh, uh, population of the projects that we've completed with Helix over the last 10 years. Those projects have been conducted in some 30 countries and they range in just typical slab applications, uh, pavement applications, slab on metal deck, um, to applications where we've completely replaced the rebar uh, reinforcement and uh, precast uh, uh, floor panels as well as arch sections and CFA piles. Uh, as well as walls, replacing minimum seismic reinforcement and walls uh, in cast-in-place structures. And finally, um, doing um, specialty work in the blast and, uh, and tornado-resistant environment um, in ICF homes. So the applications are widespread. There's really no application at this point that Helix has not been used in. So regardless of the application you're concerned for, we can always uh, point back to previous precedent and example of where the product's been used success, successfully. And we're happy to report that we've had just complete success over the last 10 years with the product without any structural failures. One of the reasons Helix works so well is it behaves in a similar manner to rebar, but at a smaller scale. So just to review, rebar acts as a secondary, well, it acts as a, it acts as a reinforcement to concrete after it cracks. The rebar does not do anything until the concrete cracks and those little ridges on it can engage. Once those ridges engage, then you get in a nice elastic, elastically perfectly plastic curve like you see in red here. The load increases up to the yield strain and then it remains constant. So just like a paper clip, it bends and it doesn't snap, uh, which is uh, a desirable characteristic for construction uh, because it provides ductility. Again, the disadvantage, the concrete has to fail first before you reach that yield strength. And second, you have to have nearly two feet or 600 millimeters of development length to reach that yield strength of the material. So it, it works on a very macroscopic level. Helix, on the other hand, works at more of a microscopic level. It's much smaller than rebar. It's 25 millimeters in length. 
its development length is actually only eight millimeters, which means that it can develop its full strength with just being eight millimeters of embedment in the concrete. The, what, what, we're, but re, what really makes helix different is the, uh, the characteristic, characteristic shape of its stress strain. Look at this green curve here. That curve looks very similar to the red curve I showed on the previous slide. It's an elastic, perfectly plastic type behavior. Um, people have been trying to do this with concrete for literally centuries, but the problem is anything that you mix with concrete, its behavior is fundamentally governed by friction. And friction is, is, is just a function of how much surface contact there is between the reinforcing element and the concrete. With Helix, we've changed the failure mechanism from friction to actual untwisting. So if you go on our website, you can actually see a piece of helix actually untwisting as it comes out of the concrete. That untwisting motion provides a constant level of resistance uh, regardless of the strain in, in the system. Uh, steel fibers, uh, which you know helix some resembles at first glance, behave in a much different, different manner because they're governed by friction. Uh, if you take a smooth piece of metal and, and, and pull it out of the piece of concrete, it just gets easier and easier to pull as it comes further and further out of the concrete. There's some other products that have some deformations on them, but they're still ultimately governed by friction. Um, so often you'll see long uh, fibers that are really designed to maximize the amount of uh, surface contact between the fiber and the concrete. But the fundamental difference is, is that they generate a constantly decreasing amount of resistance as strain increases, whereas Helix provides a constant resistance as strain increases. So the main feedback that we got from engineers as we brought this product to market was, well, you know, those are nice properties, but how do we design with it? And the easiest way to answer that was to just simply run the standard ASTM E11 that's run on rebar, which is uh, they put a piece of rebar in a tensile machine, they pull on it, and it generates that red curve that I showed a few slides ago. So what we did is we designed an hourglass shaped form. We cast uh, concrete with helix in it, installed an adhesive anchor on the top and bottom of this form. Um, the, the specimen's about uh, 600 millimeters long. Uh, the, the adhesive anchors just clamp right into the testing machine, just like the rebar does, and we ran the same exact test so that we could characterize the performance of Helix in the same way that they characterize rebar, thereby allowing you to use the same design methods that you've used for your entire career for rebar. So what we found fundamentally with uh, these tests is that there are two distinct regions of performance for helix. There's a region that's below the point at which crack forms in the concrete where the helix actually behaves like a true composite. You get multiple cracking that you can't even see without a microscope and uh, load redistribution. And I'll show a little more detail of that later. Um, once you reach a, a, a certain strain limit, which we can predict based on this testing, you get into a phase of constant tensile resistance even after a, a dominant crack form. So at that point, a, a crack that you can see, but the amount of tensile force that's, that's uh, provided uh, remains constant up to about twice the strain level of standard rebar. And the actual uh, level of tensile resistance depends on how much helix you put in. So let's just take a little bit closer look At that first part of the curve, which we call the proactive part of the curve, we actually get a very interesting behavior that we are not aware is possible with any type of reinforcement on the market presently. Uh, if you look at the two curves there, the red curve is plain concrete and the blue curve is helix reinforced concrete with, with 15 kilograms per cubic meter or 25 pounds per yard of helix. What what we see there is a significant, statistically significant, in fact, reduction in the modulus of elasticity and increase in the strain capacity of the concrete. What that means 
uh, is that the concrete is actually more flexible and can tolerate more tensile strain before a dominant crack forms, the, like you see in the picture on the right. So the slope of that red curve is going to be about equal to EC, where uh, when you put helix in, it actually decreases the slope, which isn't a bad thing. It just means the concrete's more flexible. Also, you, you can calculate the amount of energy that it takes to form a dominant crack in the concrete, and that, that's the amount of area that's under the red curve or the blue curve. And the, that area is more than twice with, uh, one, with even a small dosage of helix than it is with uh, just standard plain concrete. And not even rebar does anything to the concrete in this phase. It's, the, the reason that this is happening is because helix has a very efficient bond and doesn't let go. That twisted shape acting uh, in essence like a screw instead of a nail. It just doesn't allow itself to move so, and it, it, it functions at a much smaller scale than rebar. So you're getting contribution of the reinforcement even before that dominant crack forms. Once you do get the formation of a dominant crack, you get that region of tensile stability that I talked about on the last slab or last slide. With all these, this testing, uh, we're able to construct a model that, that allows us to re relate the tensile resistance to the number of helix in the concrete and the compressive strength of the concrete. So we ran uh, 10 different compressive strength mixes with 30 different helix quantities and developed a multiple regression model that had a high level of significance, uh, or high R squared, uh, of a 0.9 uh, with a relatively low coefficient of variation in, in, in the term, uh, only 9%. So with relatively high uh, 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 statistical significance, we're able to predict the amount of force that a given number of helix provides in tension. So in essence, we can start to think about how we could construct a, a table that relates uh, helix to a certain area of steel uh, in a conventional sense. Uh, the other thing that is important to mention is that there is a very, very variability in this, just like there is with rebar, and we account for that using the same LRFD equations that were used to develop resistance factors for rebar. What you'll find is the resistance factors for helix are, are lower because the, res the, the, the variation is higher. Variation, however, doesn't come from the force model. It comes from the fact that helix is a randomly distributed uh, reinforcement. It's a random steel reinforcement in the concrete. So we've verified the randomness of the orientation as well as the, the percentage of helix that actually contribute in resisting a given load experimentally as well as just using basic trigonometry to calculate the relationship between the number of pieces of helix in a section and the dosage that's required. So uh, we, we verified this petrographically as well as uh, through of helix uh, and the amount of force it transmits at different angles of embedment. The, this is very easy to characterize from a mathematical perspective, but what the disadvantage is is the coefficients of variation can be relatively high, up to 25% in, in this case, which makes um, it just forces us to apply more conservative resistance factors to the design when we go to the LRFD approach. So that was just a basic summary of the science behind Helix. Uh, the real question is, is, I'm an engineer, how do I implement it? Uh, we have gone to extensive lengths to, to deliver to the engineering community a third party peer-reviewed design procedure that has been backed up with data from ICC, IAS, and NADA certified laboratories. Uh, the, the approach itself has been reviewed by organizations like ICC and IATMO, uh, CE, UL. Uh, the testing comes from organizations like TEC Services and Element, which are those accredited laboratories. This document, which you see a sample of here, provides all of, the, all of the instructions that an engineer needs to design with Helix so that it's compliant with these sections of code. You're designing 
for ACI 318, uh, the BCA code or CSA or whatever code that is applicable in your region, it, it provides all the information that's required to meet the alternative product requirements. And what it, what what that what section 1.4 of ACI 318, as well as all these other sections on here, does is it says that you can design with alternative products provided that you show through analysis that the level of performance that's provided with the alternative method is equal to or greater than what's provided or required in, in, in the relevant code. So this has been set up to comply with those sections and peer reviewed so you don't necessarily have to go through all the documents. The document is available. Um, it, if you contact us, we will send you a copy. Um, it's about a six-page document that has design tables uh, and then has a four-page summary of how those were developed. And at the end of that, there's a section of reference materials, and we're happy to even send you all the reference re materials, including the, the uh, uh, test reports that were provided to the peer reviewers who reviewed this document, so you can make your own judgments about it. But the reason we had the peer review done on the product is uh, we recognize that that you are busy as engineers and may not want to go through inch or 50 millimeter thick volume on all the details. So we tried to boil it down into this simple design document with some scientific backup if you like it. I just want to emphasize that we're completely transparent. Any of this information that you'd like to see, we're happy to forward it along. Just contact us. Method is is really based on four steps. Uh, the first step is not really an extra step. It's the step that you do normally when you design with rebar, and that's you determine the amount of tensile demand in in your application, and that is simply the amount of steel that is required for whatever application you're you're considering. So if we're looking at a section in bending. Uh, specifically what that means is it means that the, the area of steel that you would provide on a nominal basis, so not without the resistance factor applied, at the center of the tension zone. Remember helix provides constant tensile resistance regardless of strain, so in essence it gives you a tensile stress block underneath the neutral axis, which can be idealized as a single piece of rebar at the center of the tension zone. So the first step is to figure out if you were going to put a rebar piece of rebar at that location, what size piece of rebar would that be? Um, and that can be done just by uh, you know developing a little spreadsheet that does it. We have where that can help with that. And again, you can contact us to get access to that. Um, but it's a relatively simple procedure because you're using the same design methods that you've used for ordinary concrete. The second is to discern to, to determine the helix design class. And as we talked about before, um, there's quite a bit of variation with helix. And because there's so much variation with helix, we've developed a three-class system that allows us to assign differing uh, concepts of failure to um, different applications. The LRFD approach uh, is fairly simple, but it requires that you assign a, a consequence of failure, which is uh, what they typically typically call a beta value and a coefficient of variation along with the, the, the model of the actual performance. So we have a class A through C system. The class A is really just slabs on grade and trinkage reinforcement. It carries an average factor of safety of 3.7. Class B includes applications like walls and uh, um, structural elements that are on ground uh, where the consequence of failure is higher but still there's no danger of anything actually falling and class C includes uh, applications where you actually have something that if it fails it falls and that has a factor of safety of 8.5 those factors of safety that I just quoted were actually those are actual field measured factors of safety as part of this peer review we had an engineering firm calculate 120 designs using this design procedure and compare them to 120 actual results of tests that were run by our customers over the last 10 years. And those are the average factors of safety that were, were, were measured. 
So once you pick the class, you uh, simply go to a table that allows you to convert that rebar that you determined in class one or in step one to a number of pieces of required helix. And then there's a second table that allows you to take that along with the section properties and determine how much helix you need in terms of pounds per square uh, or pounds per cubic meter, or I'm sorry, pounds per yard or kilograms per cubic meter. So let's just look at an example uh, very quickly to illustrate this process along with the very unique strain tensile strain check pro process that, that's integral to our design that really uh, ensures that we're always going to have the required level of ductility for the application uh, that we're considering. So here's the example, simplistic example. I'm going to do this example in SI units, although uh, the evaluation report, uh, the design document also has full examples in both uh, SI and Imperial units. Uh, so the same method applies whatever unit system you're using. Uh, so we're going to consider a 150 millimeter thick wall that is made with 30 MPA concrete. It is laterally supported at both the top and bottom at three meter spacing. So one of the things that we want to calculate is the distance between the lateral supports. In this case, it's 3,000 millimeters divided by 150 millimeters, which is 20. So that span to thickness ratio is 20. The original reinforcement that the engineer put in it, or the tensile demand that we talked about before, is N16s at 1,000 millimeters each way. So this is a relatively lightly reinforced wall. And you know, this since this used used 5 PA reinforcement, the resistance factor uh, was used was 0 0.8. So to design the wall, um, the first thing we're going to do is, uh, since the tensile demand is already known, it's the, 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 the rebar was given, we need to determine the class of design. So this flow chart can help us with that. So we just kind of start, we ask, is the structure soil supported? Well, no, it's a wall. Then we ask, is the vertical lateral or is it a vertical structure with lateral supports at less than 24 times the thickness and remember we calculated that thickness ratio of 20 so the answer to that is yes so what that means is that we are going to go with a class b design now one of the things again that is unique about the helix design method is there is a tensile strain limit if you remember back to those curves i said that the helix provides stable tensile resistance up to a point once it exceeds, we need to provide some additional redundancy to assure that uh, there's adequate ductility for the application. So when we do these designs, there's always a strain check that's involved. So we're going to go to class B design, but then we're going to do a strain check to confirm that we're okay to design in class B or the class B design meets the strain check, which is an indication that there's enough ductility in that application um, to require the use of either a different class of design or um, a, a modification in the design. And all those details of the strain check and all the restrictions are in the evaluation report. But we take uh, all those restrictions very seriously and it's very important that you review that document before designing with this to understand what they are. So the first or the, 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 the next step is to go to the first table or table one to calculate the number of helix that, that, that's needed for the application. So in this case, we had uh, the rebar that has an area of 201 square millimeters. We multiply that by the fee to get the nominal amount of steel that was required. And in this case, it's 161 square millimeters. We go to the table, we round up to the nearest um, area steel and then we go to uh, the class B column for 30 MPA and we find that we need 441 pieces of helix to replace that N16 bar. The second table then allows us to convert that number of pieces of helix into a dosage. So in this case we had 150 millimeter thick 
uh, wall and a thousand millimeter uh, width, so one square, one five square meters. We take the 441 and divide it by that area and we get 2,940 helix per square meter that are required. And when we go into the table, uh, again, we get a 30 MPA and 3,000 pieces in this case, and we get a dosage of seven kilograms per cubic meter. So fairly simple. So just to, to review, we're gonna replace N6,000 millimeters in a wall that is laterally supported at a spacing of three meters uh, with seven kilograms per cubic meter of helix. So relatively lightly reinforced uh, wall, replacing it with a fairly light dosage of helix. Helix dosages range from about five kilograms per cubic meter to 50 kilograms per cubic meter. And in imperial units, that's pounds per cubic yard up to about 80 pounds per cubic yard. The final step is to do that strain check that we talked about. And that is detailed in section five of the valuation report that I discussed earlier, that, that peer reviewed design report. Uh, but what that involves doing is going to table three in that report and determining how much tensile stress the helix is carrying. From that, we're able to compute the micro strain, which is the stress of the six divided by EC. And EC is different for SI versus uh, uh, imperial units, but that's the standard EC that you use when you uh, calculate other quantities in the codes. So for uh, SI units, that's 4200 times square root of F prime C. So in this case, we calculate that the tensile strain is 33 micro strain. Once we have that, we compare it to the limits that are established for tensile strain in section five of the valuation report. In this case, it's 76. So since that 33 micro strain is well below that strain limit um, of 76 micro strain, it's okay for class B. So what that means is that we are safely below the limit, the strain limit uh, that we've measured uh, is required through those direct tension testing, testing approach to, uh, for, for our class. Uh, so once you've got that, um, that's, that's as simple as it gets. Um, what, what we recommend you do is put Helix on as an alternative to rebar uh, on the drawing. So you have your original rebar design there, then you put um, the Helix dosage, in this case it'd be seven kilograms per cubic meter, in a note that says use the shown rebar or use seven kilograms per cubic meter of Helix uh, and see the attached calculations. And you can reference in your calculations this evaluation report or design manual, um, as well as the relevant performance-based alternative product uh, uh, code allowance. So just to review, you know, let's just kind of compare the different systems, uh, uh, rebar versus steel fibers versus helix. And I don't really like to focus too much on steel fibers, but I talk about it a little bit because Helix looks like a steel fiber and there's a tendency to want to classify it as a steel fiber. So, you know, if we just look at rebar first, um, rebar, you know, it, it doesn't have any effect until the concrete's cracked. Once it's cracked, it's stable up to about a half a percent strain. Um, there are all kinds of standard approaches uh, for uh, rebar design that are based on the section, uh, the traditional section uh, that has been around for a long time, such as ACI 318. Typically, uh, most design codes establish some minimum temperature shrinkage amount of rebar. Uh, in the U.S., that happens to be uh, a reinforcement ratio of 0 0.0018. Uh, the rebar design codes are extensively peer reviewed. Um, you can get any of the data that, that's used to support the, the codes uh, in the references. And typically, uh, rebar does not have a corrosion protected uh, layer. Uh, steel fiber, on the other hand, has been around for a long time, but has really been limited to slab on grade usage, uses only. And that's mainly because 
It has no proactive reinforcement, which means it's, it functions in the same way rebar. It doesn't do anything until the concrete's cracked. But fundamentally, after the concrete's cracked, it has unstable resistance. It, it, the, the larger that crack gets, the weaker the concrete gets. So it's just not stable enough to provide uh, tensile resistance for use in, as, as, a, as a rebar replacement. Also, the dosages have to be higher because they're just not as efficient. Um, typically, dosages, minimum dosages are around 30, 35 kilograms per cubic meter for most applications. Some, some applications go as low as 20, but 35 is a typical um, usage for, say, a, a heavy slab on grade. Um, also, most of the steel fiber manufacturers do not necessarily have all the backup uh, information right available to you like uh, Helix does in its, in its design manual. A lot of times a software is provided to do the design, but it's, it's, it's very unclear as to where the coefficients from the software come from, and there's just not a lot of transparency or peer review that's been, been done. As well, most steel fibers that are on the market are just made of mild steel. With Helix, you get a lot of advantages. Um, you know, unlike rebar, it does, it does engage the concrete even before the development of a crack. It, it actually provides a little bit more strain resistance than rebar does. Uh, its design approach used the design approach that we have uses the same principles that you're familiar with with uh, you know the typical design codes for rebar. The dosage is lower for helix than with steel fibers, which makes it much more efficient. And the reason they can be lower is because the um, the bond is so much better, and that twisted shape is so much better. Again, we've changed the failure mechanism to untwisting from friction. The design method is very much the same as rebar design. It just requires a couple extra steps looking at some tables, methods that are very familiar to engineers. Um, it has been peer reviewed uh, and tested against data. We, as I mentioned before, provide any and all data or uh, info backup information that you ask for, um, peer reviewed reports, Test third-party test re reports, etc., and then also Helix is coated with an inert zinc coating that does not uh, allow for a rapid corrosion of the metal. It's been shown to be at least three times more corrosion resistant than rebar through Department of Transportation testing. So why would you specify Helix in a project uh, for your client? Well. Uh, ultimately, engineers are providing a, a product as well. Uh, unfortunately, if you are bound by codes, uh, you're offering, in essence, a commodity. Using Helix does comply with the alternative material specifications and all of the design codes, but it gives you, as an engineering firm, an opportunity to provide your client with something that's better as well as something that that uh, actually saves time and money in construction. So uh, this is just an example. Typically, bending strength governs strain, but anytime you put helix into a concrete mix, it actually increases the amount of shear resistance, shear resistance in the concrete without even adding any additional helix because it's providing reinforcement in all directions, and shear, shear is just tension at an angle. It also increases the first crack strength of the concrete. It makes it a little bit harder for it to crack. And it increases the durability, which is the area under that curve we were talking about before. So it saves money and it gives really a better, more durable piece of concrete. As well as it has all the advantages of giving you all the peace of mind of having a fully peer-reviewed design method that we stand behind. Uh, to, to base your, your analysis and alternative calculations on. Just a couple uh, follow, uh, closing comments. One of the most common questions that I get is, does this stuff finish? Um, maybe people have worked with steel fibers before and had problems. Helix, because of its shape and its size, just goes below that pace line, and you just don't see it once it's in the mix, so it's very easy to finish for the contractors without using any special methods. And then one closing note, which is very, very important to us, is quality assurance and specification information. 
Um, obviously, Helix is a randomly distributed uh, product. Um, we've gone to extensive length to characterize the randomness of it and take that into account in the design. But there are a few assumptions that have to be met to, to make all of that valid, that is that we're reaching minimum compressive strengths in our evaluation service report or that design manual that we talked about. Um, we need somebody, whoever is adding the helix, to actually sign off that the proper dosage was applied. And uh, we do need to uh, review the mix designs, particularly as the dosages uh, increase and we get up into the class dosage um, regime. So all the details of those requirements are in the sample specification, which is available for download at uh, the link that's shown on this slide. Um, we encourage you to specify Helix as an alternative to rebar and mesh, not necessarily remove the rebar and mesh from the spec, but put Helix in as an alternative. Um, and um, as mentioned, there's a sample specification on our website that has it's a non-proprietary spec that doesn't mention the brand name Helix, but calls out the performance requirements that are needed to, to reach the levels that are provided uh, through this design method, and uh, also uh, lays out all those QA requirements so that, that it, they're made contractual as part of the construction documents. So with that, I appreciate your time and attention, and I look forward to working with you. Uh, as you begin to work with Helix in your design environment. Thank you.